Max Hall and Melbourne Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club. Trent Cochin from the Richmond Footy Club. Scott Benderbury from the Collingwood Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. It's Rory Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows. This is Tom Mitchell. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. You did it. You made it through the 2024 Fantasy Footy preseason. Hey, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you all welcome to our final episode before season 2024 from an AFL fantasy super coach and dream team perspective gets underway. And on this episode, we are answering your questions. You drowned us in questions that you wanted answers on heading into the start of the season. And so joining me on this episode is Mini Monk, mate. Firstly, an incredible preseason from you. And boy, if it's the coaches panel community absolutely frothed at the opportunity to get some questions answered through this episode. Yeah, I'm here to provide as many answers as I can. I can't say that my brain's going to be functional towards the end based on, on, on the premise of how many questions that you're throwing at me. But let's see what we can do. It's absolute ripping options that you've thrown through this gate for us. Let's dive straight in. Many of them have given us all the variables and information we need. Some are just purely a little open-ended. So we'll we'll try to guide our way through it. Hopefully we get to your question. Over on Instagram, we'll knock out those ones first. Cooper has an AFL fantasy question. He says, Dawson and a 200K defender rookie on field. So let's give it a name and let's call it House. Or a steel and a Caulfield approach. AFL fantasy, how do you like those two variables? I think the 200K rookie on field, chances are means you're also running a 200K rookie on your bench, which I don't like as much. Therefore, I'd be leaning towards the second option and having steel and and Caulfield. Yep, I like that. We are going to fly through them because there is, I like to exaggerate, but Saying hundreds might not be all that far off away. Uh, Next one, Jack Carroll is the question from Gribble9. If he gets a full-time midfield on-field role, what's his scoring potential? We know he's got at least some cash in the bank movement with that one-week score last week. He was impressive, Mini Monk, but did he do enough for you to make him want to start in your side? I think with the other options that we have in our midfield, in AFL Fantasy at least, he's definitely not one that I'd be starting. But in Supercoach and Dream Team, I'd be having a big watch for him as he's coming off of his buy. Uh, That's the beautiful thing. Heading into round three, he's on the bubble in those two formats. You'll get to know what the impact of Doherty out of the team looks like. You'll get to have some greater line of sight of when and where Sam Walsh is. So to me, I think that's a really good shout, mate. Uh, Team Martin wants to know, Jared Lyons, he wasn't used as the sub. Mm -hmm. Um, Could he be a point of difference option? His ownership across the formats is really low. Arguably, he's a cash cow in Supercoach. Another week of data is going to help. Again, he's on the bubble for us come Dream Team and Supercoach. So AFL Fantasy, I'll frame the question. I'm not sure if that's what Martin wants to do. You kind of answered it there with Carol a little bit. Mm. But AFL Fantasy for a one-week hip, the two price movements in one, and then the buy, yay or nay? Probably a nay because of the other options we have at a very similar price tag. Yeah, I think that's a fair shout too. Locke has got his question in. With many players likely to get defensive DPP, he's alluding to a few names like Martin, Amon, McKercher, Bonner, Matty Roberts. Is spending up on defenders the right call, knowing at the end of round six, we could be getting an absolute bankroll of options coming into our defensive lines? I don't have any options spending up down back to start the season because of the fact that we have the value options in the other lines. And there's nothing wrong with having a couple of DPP defenders in your midfield for a couple of rounds after that DPP change comes in and then sorting out who you want to keep and who you want to flick off at that point. You are on fire with these. You are draining it hard. I also think probably the other approach is the lack of defensive options in our rookie line almost are forcing us to be able to trade or start with these options. I'm a big believer of where the value is or where the upside is, is almost determining to a large degree what your starting structure looks like. And as you just mentioned, outside of house, there's no, and maybe you could argue Caulfield in Dream Team and Supercoach. Maybe you could argue a Burgoyne in Supercoach as well. There's not a lot under 200,000 that I go, 
get that on my field at D6. So I'm I'm very much with you in that approach. Uh, J Blacker four. Are we fading interest in Andrew Brayshaw? You were both really interested in him in the preseason, but a reduced CBAs in the practice game has him a little concerned. Both you and I have been quite bullish on uh, Andrew Brayshaw at times throughout the preseason. Where do you see yourself sitting on him now? I have faded interest in him, not purely because of the change in role, but also because of the way that the structure has kind of landed across the formats as well. I think if you're paying that 110 marker for a player, you do want complete assurity in the role. And I just don't see it. That being said, if if he shows that he can score well to start the season, I will have no issues trading into him very early on in the season. Yeah, it's a good shout. Aaron Miller's given us a couple of questions. Uh, his first one, given Darcy Cameron scored so well, could you pick him up as a, as a money-making option and then upgrade him at his buy, which is round five, and, and then it creates the opportunities of getting a, a Marshall English insert premium right here. What's your take on the performance of DC and what it might end up for us and make it, from Aaron's perspective, is he a viable play? I think this is a really interesting question. I like the way that he's asking it as a money-making play. I think it's a really tricky one because we've also talked about the value options that we have in that rock line already in terms of Gorn, Grundy, and Cherry. I think that Gorn was a bit slower on the weekend. Grundy was very good. And Cherry, we obviously haven't seen yet. I think there's a world that you can run Darcy Cameron, but you're very much going against the grain and there's a big risk involved with that. I think that's a fair shout too. Matt Roberts is the next question is about Matt Roberts. I think everybody now that wasn't on Matt has been gifted a rookie option. So I don't think the question being asked here about Matt Roberts is about whether or not you should select him or not. I think common common sense is probably a bit harsh to say, but, but common thought would be, yes, we're going to pick him. But the question is M8 or M9 with Matt Roberts. It's a big structural difference. What's your take on Matt Roberts at M8 versus Matt Roberts at M9? If you're running him at M8, you're probably running a much stronger midfield. You're probably running a couple of 900k guys, maybe a 1 million k guy in AF, and probably maybe only a couple of digs in that 700k bracket. And if you're running him at M9, you're probably running a bit more of a spending down, trying to take a bit more value. I think both make sense. And it's partly because if you're running that value option, you're running those value options in your midfield, you're probably banking that maybe two out of three pop and one fails. And if one fails, that gives you the flexibility to go, all right, I've seen enough from Roberts. I can bring him on at M8. So I think it comes down to a structural decision. I think you can do either, but I think it's about what you're expecting out of the other midfielders you're selecting in the first few weeks. It's interesting. It does feel like this year, Mini Monk, almost more seasons than before. There is a, a level of hesitance to start with three cash cows on field in, in our in our midfield line, despite us in some areas, three, four, some teams I've seen even as many as five in, in the forward line this year. And I'm using maybe the term mm. cash cow loosely a little bit there. Um it, What's your thought process behind that? Because history would say, again, history is only an indicator of future. It's never a great definer of the future, is that we get historically some of our best scoring cheap options through the midfield. Why for you would we be having that internal wrestle to go, no, I only want to run a McKercha Sanders on field, and I'm hesitant to look at the Clarks, the Roberts, let alone any of the other DPPs, the Reeds, the Lazaros, the Wilsons, the Windsors on field through there. What's your thought behind why people have that level of hesitancy? I think it's because we've got a lot more of the value options outside of that midfield this year. You know, normally we're having to spend up in one line quite heavily, and normally that's, you know, a couple of very high, high priced rocks probably a couple of high price forwards are the ones that had the midfield clock and then a few in the defensive line with a bit of value down back there. Whereas this year, if we look at our forward lines, most teams aren't really touching anyone at that really top price because we're looking at players that have had role changes, be it someone like a Fisher or a James Jordan, be it someone who might be getting a bit more mid clock, like a Heaney or a Cam McKenzie. We're looking at those value options as having the role changes. And so we're looking to spend up somewhere and, 
you know, yes, the, the the midfield rookies are typically the ones that are scoring, but it's not just that we're not running many midfield rookies. It's that we're not running many rookies at all. Like we're running a lot of cash cows. We're going to get a lot of 300, 400K guys in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team and a lot of the high 100s, low 200K guys in Supercoach. But that still means that you need to actually push some rookies off a little bit. So why not have a strong bench, you know, with the best 18 coming as well, and have someone like a Roberts, have someone like a Sharp, have someone like a Clark, have someone like a Lazaro, someone that you can pull onto your field and rotate through and do a bit of loop and action with. I think that's why we just don't have many rookies on field full stop. Yeah, it's fair enough. Pig mentalities jumped in on this is a super coach question. You know, it's going to be a good one when one of the members of Dr. Supercoach, he featured in the, the 50 most relevant for us during the preseason as well, did a banging episode on Rowan Marshall. Not too late. If you're considering a premium ruck, you go and check that out because in depth, he goes through who are the rucks that have a great run to start the year, historically speaking. So make sure you go and check that out. Wherever you're listening and watching this episode, you can go and do that as well. He says, Pick two. You know it's good when he gives you a dozen oh, yeah. names and you've got to pick two and they're not all the same position. Here they are. Jackson, Heaney, Wines, Crouch, I'm going to assume Matt, mm-hmm. Rankin, Flanders, Amon, and Nazia Wanganine Mellora. I think the first, the first one that stands out to me is Isaac Heaney. I think that he would be my first picked out of that bunch. I think Supercoach makes it a bit trickier for my second pick. I would probably be tossing up between Flanders and Amon, and I will lean on Amon. Is is that, again, just the buy elements, the ability to, to jump into Flanders off? In Supercoach, really one price movement? I think so, yeah. And I think that that Gold Coast versus Richmond game, there's a lot that can be drawn from it, but there's a lot that needs to be figured out still for Gold Coast. And their matchups in the next two weeks are not nearly as friendly as what they had on the weekend. No, no no slight on Richmond. To be fair, your Oz kick team might have, have looked half decent. Their, their effort, unfortunately, in, in that first half was very, very much underwhelming. It was you, you, improvement to see in the second half, though. I think even Rids agreed that it was uh, pretty... pretty uh, Pretty woeful. Yeah, no, when the most staunch uh, supporters of us all start to call out our own team and say effort is poor, well, well, that's one big thing. Corey Blackledge has a super coach question. I reckon this is a big one for the community, not just in super coach, but across the formats. But he's asked it for super coach. Is fading Heaney and Jackson, so not just one, both, a good idea? I don't like it in my team, but I'm, I'm not comfortable without them. So, super coach for Corey, can you fade both? I think if you're going to fade in any format, super coach is the one where you can fade. So, yes, I think it is a viable option, but be very cautious with it. So, why super coach? Just to dig on that a little bit, why super coach, if you were fading any of them, would it be these two? Because historically, these are more impact per possession style players, which is the greatest rewarding of points is, and certainly where historically they've got a higher ceiling. Why do you say super coach, you could fade them in contrast to the others? Both of them, both Heaney and Jackson do have a limited time frame associated with them. I think that Heaney's is a little bit longer and it's not as bad. Whereas Jackson were very much dependent on uh, how long Sean Darcy is out for. And whether Freo actually want to play a second ruck or not. There's a lot of mutterings about them wanting to play Reedy. I personally don't see it happening, but it could. And so then if you've got that, you want to see, right, well, how much cash can they generate me in the period of time that I have them in my team? And so what I'm looking at is what are they priced at and what can I see them going for that period of time? And I think that that's where I make the distinction. I think in Supercoach, Jackson and Heaney are priced much higher than what they are in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team compared to what I think that they can go out over that four to five week period. Yeah, that's fair enough too. Corey's also jumped in with an AFL fantasy question. Are both Ash and Blakey viable options for us? I think Ash is a much more viable option than Blakey. Uh, I think that with the way that the GWS Giants are structuring up and chipping the ball around down back, there is a potential that all of Whitfield, Himmelberg and Ash are quite relevant in our teams. 
but I'm not sure I can say the same for Sydney. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Allstate. Some people just know they could save hundreds on car insurance by checking Allstate first. Like, you know, to check you have the tickets in your wallet first before you drive two hours to the big game. Seriously, you had one job. Now the closest you'll get to the 50-yard line is parking lot D. Yeah, checking first is smart. So check Allstate first for a quote that could save you hundreds. You're in good hands with Allstate. Savings vary. Terms apply. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Northbrook, Illinois. I think that's fair. I don't disagree with that. Josh has a question that's AFL fantasy based. Rank the 700 to 800,000 mids. Okay, Josh, that's the whole podcast. If we're honest, that's the whole podcast. But rank the 700 to $800,000 midfield bracket. He's got a secondary question, but how would you put him? It feels like there's a five or six guys that you'd put in there. It's Martin, Amon, Wines, Crouch. I think you could probably put Holmes into the mix of that. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe let's go with those five. Put them in an order that not only you'd feel comfortable to select, but you think are going to be the best output guys. I think the community consensus seems to be that Martin is the number one yep. relative to price tag, relative to role. I, I think I'm pretty much in agreement there. And then I think a lot of people start to get a bit murky about what they see as their options through the next period. Personally, I have wine second, aim on third, and then I'd be tossing up between Crouch and Holmes as a fourth and fifth. Yep. I, I think you're right on that. And, and the ownership percentage would very much indicate that is kind of the cascading down of how people view it. Wines probably jumps into second a little bit more from an ownership perspective yeah. through there. Um, there's a second part to Josh's question, which is, is it too risky going in with more than two of this 700K club guy? I don't think it's too risky. And the reason why I don't think it's too risky is that if you've got three of them, there's still a downgrade option and you can still go all the way down and restructure as well. I don't think it's too risky to go three of them. And I think that I would almost advise that three digs is the way that I would be looking to go in your team. Well, like you said, let's say if people do the wines, the crouch and the Martin approach, all of a sudden Mm -hmm. aim on pops a 120 and your wines goes 80, Mm -hmm. pivot across. Even if you want to drop down a little bit, there's a, a Sam Berry who I don't think I love the call, but if he pops a, a 95, 105 this week against the Suns, you make a hundred K you drop another 200 beyond Berry and you've got a Riley Bonner who has probably had a phenomenal preseason right at that level. And then of course we spoke on the most recent episode with Matty Mottram yesterday um, or the day after that, depending on when you're watching or listening to this, he, he completely restructured with two trades of what he did. So you're not locked in. I agree. I think you can go as many as three. Four does feel heavy though, doesn't it? Yeah. I think four is heavy. I think I probably would be advocating against going four of them. Uh, And I will also say that your bailout doesn't just have to be a midfielder that you're moving to. At that point, you can trade in a defender, you can trade an extra forward, and it's fine to have a DPP player in your midfield. It's not going to be that damaging. I know that last year, by about round three, I had three DPP players in my midfield on field at that point already. It's yeah. not going to hurt you in the long run. No, like you say in the back line, you got a you got a Salem, you got a Clark, you've got a Yo. Um, there is just in that back line alone, you're almost looking at ten viable options. Let alone when the the set of field of 2024 appears, the guy we didn't think we were going to need and really outperformed becomes your money runner. So I, I think you're right. I think you can do that. Dimmy's got a question. Is Buderick and Williams too heavy on buys of getting quish, quick cash? He's considering possibly dropping to Caulfield in round three, or is it better to start Caulfield instead? A couple of questions in there. Let's start at the front end. Buderick and Williams. One's going to miss round two. One's going to miss round three. Either way, you're probably looking at a, a house, um, a Reed, a Gibkiss, Pink, Phillips type on field. Someone covering you. Someone covering that's a that's a cash cow politely. Mm-hmm. Too heavy to run those two on field with the box. I don't think it's I don't think it's too heavy, but I would just be cautious of the way that you're phrasing the question. I think that those two are cash generators, but the cash generators beyond their buy as well. I don't think you're picking Williams to trade him out after one week. I think you're picking Williams to try and ride him for five, six, seven weeks. 
Uh, and I would be looking at how many you have on the other buyers as well. I don't think many people have more than one, maybe two Brisbane and Aiden Carlton players for that round two buy. There might be a lot more for that round three buy, be it, you know, a Whitfield, uh, a Sexton, a Flanders, even a Josh Kelly. Yes, I've got him in there for you. Thank but you. these are all options that might be running. And every single one of those that you run on top of the additional one you run costs you a little bit. So just be cautious of how many you've got across the other lines as well. Genuine question. At time of recording, the Carlton side has not yet been named. There's no rumour or innuendo, but certainly Zach Williams has admitted himself in that game and the day after, pulled up a little bit sore. Mm. Carlton have had a shorter turnaround and some travel. They do have the bye after this. I'm teasing it out a little bit, but what happens if Zach isn't named? What do you do in that space? Well, what happens is all hell breaks loose. That's what happens. I think everyone just starts to go absolutely crazy with their teams and structure falls out the window. Everything that you've had said at that point just becomes irrelevant. But you should have a look at it. You know, I mean, Rids is a big advocator of it. What's your plan? Because... Yes, he might pull up fine, but, you know, who, who knows that he's not laid out an hour and a half, two hours before the game? Who knows that, you know, that midfield or rookie that you've had at M8 for the entire preseason suddenly isn't named? It's it's just you've got to know where you're moving to. That's why it's not just about the 30 players that you currently have sitting in your squad. You probably have five, six, maybe even up to 10 players that are in your mind as to where you should be moving to that you'd like but probably just don't like enough. And if one player drops out because they miss, because they're injured, because something happens between now and when teams are named and when they play their game, you should know what are the players that you like and who you want to be moving towards. It's a good shout. Uh, Next question from Andrew. I'm paying up in my defensive line. Mm -hmm. Is four premium defenders too much? Again, doesn't tell us the players, doesn't tell us the format and doesn't tell us the definition of premium which technically you might be able to say history would say it's Christian Salem and I would not call him a premium. Mm. But let's take that variable out from a conceptual space. Guys that are priced 90, 95 and above in our mindset and maybe, a, you know, sneaking a few in the mix of that. Mm. Too deep in the in the defensive line, running skinny elsewhere or, or are you pretty comfortable with four primo defenders? I don't mind it. I, I don't mind it. I have looked at structures that do have four, maybe not 90 plus, but definitely 85 plus. And I think it's something that definitely looks at. And, you know, if Williams comes out, if Williams is, say he does miss, I'm not saying that he will or anything like that, but that might be a way that people pivot. They might have to pivot towards a Ford premium defender structure. So yeah, no issues with it at all for me. Harry, one, two, six on uh, X is Judd McVeigh an option at D6 with Bowie going down on the Demon side. Went at 74 in opening round. Was a cash cow for us last year. I, I don't really love the idea of jumping into Melbourne defenders. Salem's the only one I've got any interest in, uh, to be fair, because history would say they're not a great scoring defensive unit anyway. But any interest in you with, with no Bowie to get a slice of McVeigh? It'll be interesting to see how they adjust. If they were to bring in someone like a Howe, uh, that would be very interesting in terms of the scoring that McVee might have. I, I see Rivers is probably the one that gets a bit more of a bump than, than McVee does. And I think it's just a really awkward spot. I know that we've got Zach Williams at you know D5 or D6, depending on where you are. I, I, I don't think I'd want to pair that with a Judd McVee as well. Yeah, it's a fair shout. Brisbane Bloods Fantasy says, what are your thoughts on fielding three rookies on field in the mids? Kind of answered that for you, Brisbane. So I hope that helps. How many 800K players is the right number in defence? So let me list some names Ooh. while you ponder that. Oh, Naziah oh. Wanganine Miller, Lockie Whitfield, Dan Houston, Hayden Young, your boy. Lockie Whitfield, I think I've mentioned him. Nick Newman does pop now a little bit into the radars with no Sam Doherty. Jaden Short, Tom Stewart, Harry Sheasel, and even a Luke Ryan. You could probably throw in the mix. Yes, I'm throwing some shade at Liam Duggan by not mentioning him there. Um, You're also throwing shade at Nick Dacos by not mentioning him either. 
I suppose he said 800k players, so I didn't want to head towards the million He's, dollar mark. He said 800 plus. Yeah, Look, okay. I, I think that you know, as I was just talking about before, uh, if you class a premium as being probably about that 85 plus, that's about the 800k bracket. That's probably where I'm drawing the line at this stage. I think that Hayden Young is probably the cheapest price defender that I can confidently say I, I would probably classify as a premium in my yep. squad. Um, and so I think that at this stage, it's probably three, maybe four that you could run. Yep. Harkening back to the previous question. Yeah, I think that's a fair shout. Was I, it says thoughts on Buderick and Caulfield. Uh, Buderick played in opening round. Caulfield has been confirmed to play, whether or not that's as the sub. Yep, I'm just being cheeky at the moment, but he <laughs> won't be, but I'm being cheeky a little you bit. You never know there. with Bevo. Oh, that's, that's true. He could be playing at full forward. Um, yeah. What's your take on both of those players? I think there's the longer the preseason has gone on, the less I've really been wanting to go Caulfield in, in AFL fantasy. I think you can easily move in towards him, but I don't see him being someone that's going to generate a lot of cash and fast. I think I have maybe a 65, which whatever at that point. Buderick is interesting though, because of that round zero score and because of the role that he played. High marks, bit of a slippery game, but still managed to rack up. Was against Richmond though. Can he back mm. it up in a couple of harder games? Not 100% sure. But at that price tag, if he just goes 270s from here and you trade him out at round three, you'd probably say that that's fine. You'd probably say that that's a win. So there's a lot more interest there for me than than with Caulfield. Yeah, it's a fair shout too. Caulfield for me feels like he's a fortnight away from getting dropped. All it mm. takes is back-to-back bad games, mm. in, either in a defensive matchup or some skills-wise, doesn't make a couple of good choices. I, I don't think he's f- secure in that best 22, Buderick appears very much so um, mm. to be in that space. Sir Egbert, oh my goodness, some of these handles are ridiculous. Um, he says, are we overthinking the preseason role change for some of these uber premiums? He uses Rory Laird as an example. I don't see a Rankin and a Berry really pushing him out when the real stuff gets cracking. Am I being stubborn, bullish, even though he just said himself on Adelaide's news in the past 24, 48 hours that he's going to spend some time forward? What's your take on that? Because again, a lot of people have been bullish on Rory. He was very high on the 50 most relevant. Mm. So clearly in the preseason playing, he, he was a pretty safe and comfortable option for people. Is it overreacting mm. or is it the light, right level of adjustments from coaches? It's really hard to know. I think him spending a bit more time forward isn't that he's going to be playing like a half forward role. I think it's that he's just going to be resting a bit forward and might drop CBAs from say 80% to 70% and spend a bit more time lining off of half forward which isn't a bad thing, but I think it's it's important to draw the t- distinction between a role change and what's going on with the rest of the team as well. Because for someone like Brasher, I think it's not really a role change, but it's more to accommodate other people coming into that midfield. Whereas for someone like Laird, you know, it might be the exact same. They're trying to get a lot of my, mid, mid time to Matt Crouch. They might be trying to run Sam Barry through there a bit more and, and Rankin through there a bit more as well. It's not a role change. They're still midfielders. It's just about how much of the pill can they get. And so it's just, it's reason to be concerned. But if you still like the player, you can still go for the player. Rory Led's the kind of guy that scores anywhere. Um, he, yes. He's, he's the sort of guy that even if he's spending instead of two center bounces a quarter on the bench and one on the bench is now two on the forward line, I'm actually, the chance of him holding that scoring floor if not growing i'm not opposed to it that said i'm not picking rory at the moment but but i wouldn't be i wouldn't let that talk me out of it uh next question from callan who would you feel better picking newcomb or amon amon i agree tyson says if nank is out again which again maybe the time you're listening to this you know um he Mm. did do full training in the main session Mm. on tuesday for what it's worth um, but Liam Reedy is named for the Dockers. Are we picking Naismith with the potential job security risk or Reedy from Fremantle, who may only be in the side for four to six weeks' time, if at all? You're the Fremantle Docker. He's a 200-centimetre ruckman. Uh, what's your take on how... I, I think Nankervis is back. It's whether or not Naismith takes that Samson Ryan mm. Role, I think that's the more likely play mm. there. What's your take on Reedy? Because it feels like he's still developing and Jackson should be the better ruck, but he is a handy forward. 
Yeah, that's a really tough one. I- I'm not sure I can see Reedy breaking to the side consistently. Consistently enough to score enough points to go up the cash that we typically see an R3 be able to. And that's the big difference. Like we're always looking for those R3s that can generate a lot of cash, but typically they make a lot of cash because they become the sole Ruckman or the primary Ruckman for their team at a price tag that is much lower than what you would happily, you typically have for a primary Ruckman. So I'd much rather Naismith and and probably just pay that extra 20K, he'll come in for the occasional game or two or three, eventually hit the bubble and super coach and dream because you're not touching Naismith now. No, 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 no. Of course, he's clearly a super coach or dream team question. But but in those formats, he presents so much value if he's even just able to hit that bubble. And at some point during the season, you can take 50, 100, 150K off of his head. I'd much rather run that corner with Naismith than run it with Reedy. And and don't forget, he, he's going to become an option for you for your captaincy and vice captaincy loopholes through these buy rounds as well. So yeah. even if he doesn't play, okay, round th- round two, round three, round four, you, you give yourself these non-playing options to maximize. So yeah, I, yeah. I'm with you on that. Agent Carroll says, what is the likely effect of Coleman absencing out of the team with Brisbane, especially in terms of who becomes relevant? Are, are you in the leaning that it's a bit like Melbourne where you're like, I want to see it before I touch it, or is there a, a player that might pop here from your perspective? I think I want to see it before I touch it. I think that it will be Wilmot and McKenna. McKenna didn't play last week. He's apparently been named to play, well, likely to play and fly over for this week's game against Frio. But I definitely want to see it, especially at that price tag, and especially with their those two players' susceptibility for having both the ceiling game but also a floor game. Yeah, in a draft, I'd actually try to grab both if they're both Agreed. sitting there on the waiver wire. Handcuff yourself to them and hope that whichever one pops, okay, you're absolutely set. James Walker's yep. got a question. It's between these two options. I love these ones. Bonton Crouch. Again, I'm going to mm-hmm. assume that. Matt, no shade on Brad. He's a lovely guy. Spent some time with him doing some media stuff. I'm backpedaling from last year where someone thought I hated Brad Crouch. I was anti <laughs> him. I'm, I'm pro Brad as a person. I just was anti him at fantasy football at that time. Back mm-hmm. on track, MJ. Bonton, <laughs> Matt Crouch, or Dawson. I'm assuming Jordan, not Zach. Dawson and Amon. <laughs> Which of that combination do you like more? Bonton, Crouch, or Dawson and Amon. No format given. So totally not helpful, James. Mm. I, I think it's very different. I think if it's super coach, I might go Bonton and Crouch. But I think in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, I'd go Dawson and Amon. Oh, I like that. And then he's given us one more. If he got Rosie instead of Bond and Dawson, he could get either of Amon and Crouch. So it's probably more about what do you think Connor Rosie is going to do for us this year? Probably becomes the defining factor. I don't mind going a Rosie and an Amon. So I would look at that. And that's because across formats. Rosie has got as good an early fixture as you could ask. Is as consistent 100 plus performer over the past 12 weeks of 2023 that you could ask. And some players just rise to leadership, don't they? And yeah, he feels he's, like he might be that kind of guy. He's also got the best buy you could ask for. Yep, it's not bad, is he? All right, dream team question. Thank you, Tenacity, for giving <laughs> me the format. We appreciate you. Windsor versus Campbell. Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my hundredth mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, no, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. He says the extra cash either way basically determines Nazia Wanganine Miller or Tom Stewart, which is a significant jump. I would say of all defenders, Geelong's got the best week one matchup, historically playing St Kilda. 
I think they've also got the best six week matchup the defenders going mm. around. What's your I there? Seth Campbell was gonna have his price change earlier than Windsor by a week. He will. So the question is, do you see Wanganin Miller as being a keeper or someone that you're going to trade out? Because I view Stewart as being a keeper. And if that one trade is used to do Campbell to Windsor at round three, I don't mind it. I would go Campbell and Stewart. We spoke just on the most recent strategy episode. Again, wherever you're getting this episode, you can go back and check that out with Matty Mottram, who won AFL Fantasy back in 2022 and fellow co-founder Rids, who won Dream Team in 2020. So if you're looking for some pedigree to help you get through this next few days before opening round into round one starts, these boys have been there, done that, won that. So you want to go and check that out. We spoke a little bit about a strategic ideology that DT Lemon put on the board, which was mm. Chariot R3. Daniel Warland wants to know, is it a viable strategy? He's not sure he's got the guts, um, but very much contemplating it. What's your initial reflections on Chariot 3? I've looked at it. I think that you'd have to have some big cojones to go for it. You're going to give up a lot of points early on to coaches. And you have to see it through. To if you're going six. to go cherry, you have to see it through to round six. If you're doing cherry at R3, you have to hold. Don't get baited. Don't just think, oh, you know, one of them's struggling. I'm just going to flick them off. You're in it until round six. And then you assess there whether you've won or whether you've lost. Yeah. I think it's a really, really good shout because it is the kind of play that you see a, a 600 or 700 guy pop a, a 130, 140, and you go, oh, Grundy could yeah. get me to that. Oh, yeah. Another hundred K on top of cherry. I could do that. And, and all of a sudden it does feel like you've undone some stuff. I'm all for being nimble, but I, I think that's a fair shout that if you're committed I, to it, you're committed to it. I think if Grundy and Gorn had the round two and round three buys respectively, cherry R3 would be a much, much, much better play. And I think that there would be a significant portion of the community moving towards that, but maybe next year. Yeah, it's a good one. Nathan has a dream team and fantasy question. So again, different price movements, but the good thing is the premise isn't based on the price movements. Who's the safest premium midfielder? He's struggling to pick them outside of Bont and Green. Bont, you could argue, is at a peak price point. I don't think anyone would disagree with that too much. And Green does have the round three buy. So those are probably the negatives of why people might not go there if you had to pick one that was the safest i'll I'll put a line on it for you a 108 who is the safest 108 and above premium midfielder i mean the answer is obviously bontempelli because he did it last year he went 118 dtaf but that's that's the boring answer Thank you. I think I think the right answer actually is Tom Green. He does have the round three bye, but you look at the round one and round two matchups against North Melbourne and West Coast. It's just, you know, he's got reins over the midfield. He had a good game against Collingwood on the weekend. There's no reason why he can't go 110 for the rest of the year. I think he's the one that's probably the next safest. Who'd be third? Zach Merritt. But not round one. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I, I'm going to go, who's fourth? We'll work out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. So the interesting one. George has got another one. We are almost done. There's still a, actually, that's not true. There's still like 12 to go. But uh, I, th- I didn't realize I needed to click over to another tab. George says, what are your thoughts on fading Dacos until after his buy and look at a, a Salem or, or Buderick? Because that allows him to get a, a Jackson and a Heaney up front. I've been very vocal that I don't think that Dacos is the right player to start an AFL fantasy and dream team. I'm slightly coming around to it in super coach, but I'm still hesitant at this stage. And I think that there was a lot, there's a very it, it, it's in the realm of possibilities that fading Dacos until he's by is the right call 
But there's also the realm of possibility that fading day costs until his buy takes the season away from you. So it's a very <laughs> scary call to make. But I'm comfortable enough doing it. It's such a fascinating one, isn't it? Because we speak about a, a player with high ownership. Mm. And from a community perspective, like a broad overarching statement, you look at his ownership percentage and he hits that risk criteria area for you mm -hmm. every day of the week. A guy that can go 130, 140 every single day. He was politely in probably second gear. Like Collingwood were really just playing kick around footy and probably the most selfish style of football I've seen them play against GWS where they were doing things they normally would never do. And yet he still popped 110 plus in AFL Fantasy, 130 in Supercoach. It does feel he's the kind of guy that ownership will kill you, but then you consider the more uh, aggressive coach, those that are probably playing to win it, the more consensus, certainly across content creators and the, and the mantra they've been championing, and it's a, it's a royal we, by the way, mm. has been to take him on. Um mm. It does get interesting too because the super aggressive tactical coach is probably trying to take it on. The community is going, why would I? And so I think mm. that's where the ownership isn't deceiving, but it's hard to get that read on because it does feel like everyone that is just jumping and going, pick a team. Yeah, Dacos is awesome. I'll pick him and not worrying about fixtures, matchups, spies, might not even mm. be aware of those parts of the game. So that's where ownership percentage can lie a little bit. It, it definitely does lie. You you go into your team, you go to your defensive line, you go to the highest price player and you click on him. And what do you know? Dick, Nick Dacos is in your team come round one. His ownership in AFL Fantasy is an adjusted 72% at the moment. And that's of active players? That's, in of, active, that's of active completed teams. It's at 72%. It's an absurdly high number for someone who has the ability to go for a five-week block at 130. Now, whether or not he goes at 130 is up to probably the coaches that he's playing against, i.e. the AFL coaches that he's playing against and what they decide to do to negate him. Because if they let him have free reign for those five weeks, you, as an AFL fantasy super coach or dream team coach, might be in a world of pain, much like they might be in a world of pain. Sydney, St Kilda, Brisbane, all are Thursday or Friday night games. Those are his first three yep. opponents. So VC option as well. I think Sam Mitchell has telegraphed it for us a long way out around Finn McGuinness that he's paraphrasing him now, but mm. Finn McGuinness might not be in our side in every week. But he'll be on our side in certain weeks. You, mm -hmm. That is Nick Dacos is coming after you without saying Nick Dacos is coming after you. It does feel think, like that and the buy side by side of the definers. Yeah. I think you'll also be in the side round one to mm -hmm. uh, line up against a very lonely Zach Merritt with no Darcy Parish alongside him, just as a word of warning. And why I was very much like, oh, Merritt might be a 110 mid, but I wouldn't start him. I think that. Ross Lyon has shown a propensity to throw a tag on players early on in the season mm -hmm. and it, for it to come out of nowhere as well. Windhager did a job on Caleb Sarong in round one last year. Yep. I wouldn't be surprised if he tries to send someone to him. And I also wouldn't be surprised if Longmuir, Longmire, Longmuir, I always got them mixed up. Long, Longmire, John Longmire, horse, sends a tag to Dacos as well in the form of someone like James Rowbottom because he didn't have a high CBA role on the weekend. That wasn't his job. Yeah, But I wouldn't be surprised if he does that in the, in his game. Uh, Fagan has also at times let a Jared Berry play an accountable football mm -hmm. role as well. So you might argue that he's coming out of the first four weeks with a 130 average. I think you could also argue he's coming out of there with a 90-95, which... Mm great, you've got him, you don't have to worry about trading into him. That takes that risk component or or trade cadence plan out of consideration for it. Because, of course, a player's price, once you own them, to a degree is irrelevant matter. unless yeah. you're trading them out. I agree with that. But if you can move the other variables around it and it works. I, I've been at times really anti-starting Dacos, there's been times where I've started Dacos. 
then there's been times I've swung back both ways. I'm very much on a knife edge about Mm. what I do about Dacos at the moment. And I think more people that are not starting Dacos aren't articulating their level of fear correctly about going against him, that they are underplaying it. It's this positive self-talk. It's going to be fine. I'll get him at round six. It's not going to kill me. And they could be sitting there at the end of the round three going, he's going 135. And he's now paying there could be some sleepless nights and some agony and ecstasy and you might not want to watch Collingwood play or even look at the scores for the first five weeks that they play. And that's okay, but it's all about how you want to play the game at this point. And as you said, there is a pathway. Every single one of those opposition have shown a propensity to use a midfielder to stop a midfielder. Hmm. And Dacos could be rolling a 90-95 And you spent that money, you faded the Sheasel, the Whitfield, the Stewart, the whoever at D1 looking for an anchor. And now everybody's dodged the difficult matchups. They've dodged the missed score. And now they're getting him at a 100,000 cheaper. So uh, it does feel like it's interesting. I don't think it's season defining though, either way, which which is a Mm. good thing. I don't feel like three matches because the round four one he's getting McGuinness unless he's yes. injured or suspended it's three weeks can you take your medicine for three weeks or do you just need the security and you want a VC option it, it, those are the two decisions that you've got to make through there let's hit our last couple of questions before we wrap up this episode Chad's got it's more a statement than a question Flanders F1 early buy McRae restricted February and can get bevoed. Jackson didn't play preseason, period. That's not a question, Chad, but clearly he's on the Flanders track. McRae is apparently not going to be playing round one. Jackson missed the preseason game. It was due to concussion. He just got a bad head knock. I think it was against Ruben Jinbi. Those happen, but if he has the role, he can definitely match Flanders. Flanders with the early buy, I think in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, just I, I just don't want a piece of it. I think in Supercoach, there's an argument that you could have that he is someone that you could pick and, and be very comfortable with him at F1. I'm still tossing on it, but I think that you know it's probably between Jackson and, and Flanders in F1 in Supercoach. Yeah, it's fair enough. Mal, uh, Big Mal in Tassie. He's been a long-term supporter of the coaches panel. He's been around since day one, Big Mal. He's also a Patreon. We love you, mate. Uh, thoughts on a captain loophole in all formats or is cash generation more important? So he's talking about throwing a spot. Traditionally, we'd look at R3 for that. Although in a dream team and super coach, there has been at times an M11 um, has, has been the option. Which to you is more valuable? The ability to loop or the ability to maximize your cash generation? I am very much in the camp that you can make up the points later on in the season. If you build your team value, if you get a premium or half a premium ahead of the rest of the teams around you because you've got that extra cash, you take that every day of the week. So I don't think you force it. I think if it comes in AFL Fantasy or Supercoach or Dream Team that we don't get the R3 because let's be honest, that's where it's looking like we're not going to get it. If you don't get that player that comes out and has a game, that's where you go. You take the loop. If Naismith's not named in round one for Richmond, but there's no other R3 named, I'd probably still go Naismith because he's already got that game under his belt for his bubble. But if you if there's someone playing and they're at the basement price and they can generate cash for you, you take that every day of the week. Yeah, it's a good shout. Ian McRae said, is Gold Coast going to be fantasy relevant as a side for us this year or was Richmond just that bad? Probably a bit of both. I think it's a fair shout too. David says, round two and three by premiums. The, who are they that might become unattainable? He's used Tim English as the contrast point. Mm. So should he be considering a Tom Green, who you mentioned that early matchup, has already got a ton and a, and a big one in super coach and a, mm. and a solid enough one in dream team and fantasy. Is he the unattainable premium mid that we can get to round four and go, I just don't know how I can get him now. I think in super coach, he's probably the one I think in AFL fantasy and dream team. It's Whitfield. Yep. Yeah. Good shout, but not a mid, but same idea could be unattainable by, by his buy. Yep. Heaney or Jackson. Doesn't give us 
any format, it might don't not be it. relevant. Don't if you're don't only need a picking one, okay, who are you going and why? Why it's Heaney he. and not Jackson? Because he's already got the runs on the board. Deciding which credit card or loan is right for you is like trying to choose where you want to eat for dinner. Except when you finally get to the restaurant, the menu is riddled with jargon that no average foodie could understand. So at Credit Karma, we keep things simple. We show you personalized recommendations that align with your money goals and help you turn the confusing fine print into terms you can actually understand. And as a cherry on top, we provide a detailed overview for a new card or loan before you apply. That way, we can help you make decisions faster and with more confidence. Download Intuit Credit Karma today to get started. It's pretty simple, really, isn't it? Uh, all right, last couple of questions. You said uh, that five minutes ago. I feel like it, it, it's because I keep <laughs> closing tabs and I'm like, oh, an, another tab. Uh, <laughs> another bunch of questions. These actually, some of these come from your Patreon Keeper League uh, mm, members. Mm. So for a bunch of our Patreons, we ran a Keeper League for them. I think it was three AFL Fantasy and one Super Coach one. So the, this is your mob. Uh, that yeah. reached out to you. So these are your tribe. Can't even tell you their names because all I see is photos on, on this one. Uh, but how deep is too deep to run in our squad? He's alluding to Caulfield at D7. Um, one mid-rookie on the field. He's got Cherry at three, especially if we're looking at a couple of these. Uh, what do you think is too deep here? I think one rookie in your midfield is too deep. I think that you want to be running those two midfield rookies in McCurcher and Sanders. I think that that's... A fairly consensus and for good reason. Both have got really good roles. They're both fantasy accumulators. They could easily be averaging 80 over the first month and you don't want to miss out at that at that price point on your field. I think Caulfield at D7 is a viable option. I think he's someone that could generate cash. If you really don't like someone like a Zach Reed at, at D7 and you want to run house and Caulfield to pair with him isn't a bad option. And we talked about Cherry R3 before. I think that it's viable, but man, you've just got to be able to to stomach all of it through to round six. Well, it gives you that option, like you said, of um, you lose Zach Williams in round two, he comes on field. You lose mm -hmm. a Buderick or a Whitfield in round three, he comes on field. Mm -hmm. You lose a Dacos if you're going that way in round five, he comes on field. You lose a Salem or a Short in round six, he comes on field. So I, I don't mind it. Neither do I. I don't, I don't mind it. Uh, I'm not going to use his name. I think it's Stuart, but I'm going with Disco's Deadlifts. Uh, that's clearly the team name or his parents didn't like him. What strategy <laughs> appeals to you more? Jackson and Heaney at F1 and F2 versus a premium level or a deeper midfield featuring some of the big four premium midfielders. And the big four, you mean, you know, what? Bond, Green, Dawson, or are we talking in that 700K bracket? I, you tell me. This is your group of God. people. I have no idea. Uh, I think that having Jackson and Heaney at F1 and F2 is definitely something that you could look at. And I think that having someone, you know, in that high price bracket and another one or couple in that medium price bracket is definitely viable. Or pairing, you know, say an aim on with a Heaney, I think is also viable. But I think it's a lot more decisions that come about than just that decision. Yeah, it's a good shout. Uh, Stuart from a Tom Variety, short or Whitfield at D2? Doesn't mean you can't have one of them at three, but if you're picking one at D2, who are you picking and why? In I, I think this is an AFL fantasy question. So who, who have you got and why? I, I think that I'm riding short off the board of those three at this stage, sure. uh, purely because you can contrast Whitfield and short immediately based on that. And then you're having a look at the run. And if you look at Whitfield, he's got, I think it's North Melbourne and West Coast. And then if you look at Short, uh, sorry, at um, Stuart, the run is just very, very good. Ooh. I have played with both since round zero has concluded. I like both a lot. I think that I'm leaning towards Whitfield at this stage. And is that just more the money component rather than the scoring component or, or a combination of both? I think it's a money and a scoring component. I think that Whitfield does have a very, very high ceiling and I'm a bit, little scared of, of um, Stewart's age, just a little. Sure. And I think that it gives you a lot of flexibility to make decisions at his buy because there's a world where he is 150K more expensive at his buy and he's in that mid 900s range and you can choose to flip him. And there's a world where he's at that price 
and you can choose to stay on them and have a pod that anyone else can't jump onto. Yeah, good shout. Uh, for AFL Fantasy is having Dacos, Roberts, Grundy, Jordan and Heaney on the same by too many? It's not too many, but you need to have a plan as to how you get to less. I don't think that Dacos is one that you want to trade out at his buy. I think if you're holding him, you're holding him for the long run. But all of Heaney, Roberts, uh, Jordan and Grundy have the ability to be traded out at their buy. So explore it. Yeah. And probably one last question. I'm assuming this might have been the big four that was being alluded to because there's a bunch of other questions about sure. Wines, Crouch, Martin, which we've kind of answered, or the, the early buy premiums, including Green. In fact, there's a second last one. We'll, this is the second last one with one more we want to get to. Who are you more comfortable paying up for? Brayshaw, Laird, Goulden? And then he drops down a bit to Butters. So who's the M1 you feel most comfortable paying for? Of those four, butters. I agree. Everything read, not not read. Roll is there, rock matchups there, and and the ownership has now come down to such a level where there's a little more upside that, that probably was a fortnight ago, where where his ownership was so high. So, I think I agree with that. Uh, last one: How agile is being too agile? When it comes to running early by guys coming off big scores, he's listed Salem, Viney, Whitfield, Heaney. There's a ton of them that that popped for us last week. How much is loading too much of the dice? Because we've said a few times on this channel, opening round is going to save people from some mistakes, whether that be some injuries they've dodged out of, some cash cows missed, some premiums that are going to fall off the mm. cliff from, from a pricing element. And it's also going to trick a lot of people because they over yoke and overcook what they're doing. So where is this line of being agile and, and taking the, certainly in AFL fantasy, where the, the likelihood of the guaranteed money made is there. And the reason I say that is it's a two for one price cycle movement. So in theory, even with a down score, it won't be as dramatic. Whereas Dream Team and Supercoach, they still not have moved just yet. So we can't guarantee it. They can undo it or save themselves. I'm thinking of a golden type mm. with a 150-150. He's net neutral all of a sudden and, and that poor mm. score doesn't matter. How agile is too agile? It, that might be the competition winning question this year. I think there'll be a lot of coaches that'll look back on the decisions that they made between round zero and round one and be very comfortable that the decisions they made were great and they put them into a good spot. And I think there'll be quite a few coaches that feel like they ruined their squads between round zero and round one. Obviously, we're not going to find that out for six, eight, ten weeks from now. I think we have to read into roles as much as we read into scores and look at the games as well. You know, if we're talking about someone like Goulden, that game was played in less than ideal conditions for someone that gets their ball on the outside significantly. And he didn't have a high CVA role like many expected he might with the players that were out of that Sydney team. That might change week to week. The conditions he play in will obviously change week to week. But if you can read in together with all of those factors, what the price movement's going to be, what the matchups are going to be, what you project the player going out until they're by and potentially onwards from that, that will set you apart. So you need to be agile, but don't go ripping your team apart in order to fit every single early buy player into your team. Uh, mate, you've been an absolute superstar, not just throughout the preseason for us, but on this episode answering so many questions. Mate, we love having you part of the coaches panel. Thank you for your advice you've given the community so far this preseason. And the good news is the real stuff's about to begin. We're almost there. It's just around the corner and I cannot wait. The good news is once we get through this first round, there is going to be a ton of content you get from us. There is going to be three podcasts every single week. One, a round review episode that you get from me that is available exclusive to our top tier Patreon supporters or to our Spotify podcast subscribers. Maybe you don't want all the other Patreon rewards. You're like just 
put the podcast into my veins. Okay, no problem at all. You can do either of those. You will get them every single Monday of the season, a round review. Premium tier Patreons get it. And our Spotify podcast subscribers get it. I think it's only like five bucks a month there. So if all you want is podcasts and not all the other stuff that Patreons get, that is where you can go. That is coming for you every single week. And then as we promised you at the end of 2023, a strategy roundtable set aside for AFL Fantasy and a strategy roundtable set aside for Supercoach. So there is potentially three podcasts you get from us every single week of season 2024. So I think we've done like 70 episodes almost this preseason. So you've heard a lot of me. The good news is you can hear even more during the season proper if you like all the details for where you can subscribe to our getting our Patreon and the Spotify subscription on podcasts are in the details of this. You can also go and check us out over on YouTube. Uh, just thank you so much to the hundreds and hundreds over a thousand people now subscribe to that channel thank you so much you've done that if you haven't already jump on over and do that we would greatly appreciate you subscribing turning notifications on so you can watch these episodes as well as listen so friends we're pretty much on the edge of round one depending on your listening to this some of the cash cows are known potentially some teams are known and now all it is it's up for you to take in all the information you've absorbed from us and others over this preseason, make final decisions, knowing fully well that mistakes are just opportunities for success. If you get adventurous and you get bold, don't let any setbacks that this week might throw at you think it rules you out. You can make some mistakes early and still redeem it. So you're not ruled out of it equally. If you nail some things early, you can really set yourself up for some big, bold attacking moves to start the year. We wish you all the best, and we cannot wait to be chatting with you next week for another episode of the Coaches Panel as we get into the serious stuff of 2024.